Yes, I uh, I have the honor to chair my uh, my dear friend uh, Professor Hani Arif and moderating this uh, webinar. Uh, I think this is the third wave for the neurology department uh, in Shams University about uh, stroke. Uh, I have the honor to uh, introduce uh, Professor Alexander from Portugal. He has uh, works in the neurology department, Central Lisbon Hospital Center, uh, till uh, 2010. Uh, then uh, works in uh, uh, cerebrovascular stroke unit uh, hospital, uh, the Sao Joseph uh, Lisbon, uh, up to uh, 2015. He uh, is now is the head of a neurosonology laboratory uh, and has uh, eight international publications with uh, three book uh, chapters. He had the master's degree advisor in health management. He is the coordinator of beer training and uh, health education program, stroke learning and living. Uh, we will talk about uh, Neuro Expert Experiment uh, Academy. Uh, uh, Professor Alexander, uh, you are welcome, and uh, uh, you can give your uh, lecture now. Professor Alexander. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening from Lisbon, Portugal. It's um, it's an honor for me to to have this uh, this talk we, with you, um, and. Uh, um, uh, I would like to uh, compliment uh, all uh, the participants. So, um, uh, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to share with you some ideas about uh, the use of neurosonology techniques in stroke. This is the first part of my talk, and in the second part, we will discuss some issues concerning the use of CT coding in the management of acute stroke. So, um, when we when we talk about about stroke, we talk about uh, uh, thrombus and we talk about recanalization. We talk about the the state of the of the blood vessels, mainly the brain blood vessels. So uh, the neurosonology techniques give gave us the opportunity to look directly to the circulation, so the, to the pre cerebral circulation and the cerebral hemodynamics. So when you talk about echo Doppler, we are talking about all these techniques and we are talking about uh, techniques that are accessible, non-invasible, and that we can use at the bedside of the patient to examine the blood vessels. We have real-time information both on morphology and the uh, uh, hemodynamics of the extra and intracranial circulation, despite some limitations of the technique mainly mm, concerning the operator dependent and so the experience of the operator in performing these techniques. So when, um, when we talk about carotid and vertebral Doppler, we can have direct assessment of the morphology of the vessels, the arterial structure and both the anatomic variants. So we can look at the, at the wall of the vessel and the arterial lumen as uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the same time, some of the adjacent structures that can imply with the, uh, with, the, with the vessel, with the arterial vessel. So, uh, when we talk about the hemodynamic uh, parameters, we are looking at the flow direction, at the signal sound, at the flow speeds, at the resistant index, the spectral analysis, and uh, we can also look at the, uh, or we can also assess the collaterality, uh, showing the compensation phenomena when some of the vessels are occluded. So we can do this in extracranial vessels and in intracranial vessels by using ultrasound techniques like the transcranial Doppler or the color-coded uh, transcranial Doppler. So at this point, the importance of looking at the vessels is it's really high. And so and when we talk about primary centers and comprehensive centers by looking at the ESO guidelines, we know that having a good neurosonology department is of utmost importance because it gave us the opportunity to look at every time point to the state of the circulation of the pre-cerebral and cerebral circulation. So when we talk about primary centers, we, are, we, we need to have neurosonology investigation within 24 hours. And when we talk about comprehensive centers, we think about centers that have 
the possibility to use these techniques, both uh, color-coded uh, duplex ultrasound, extracranial and intracranial, 24 over 24 hours. And so I look at th these neurosonology techniques as the stethoscope of the vascular neurologist, because we need to know at every time point what is happening in the blood vessels. So I would like to share with you some ideas, starting with this uh, uh, simple case report. We are talking about a 64-year-old male with a past history of dyslipidemia, and he goes to the emergency department because of a sudden onset, uh, an episode of sudden onset of speech disturbance lasting for about 30 minutes. So the neurological examination was normal. He performed a CT scan that was also normal. And the doctor that was looking at the patient was thinking about discharging the patient and looked uh, at him and re-evaluated re him in, the, in our TIA clinic. But we have the opportunity to perform the uh, transcranial Doppler and the carotid Doppler ultrasound right in the emergency department. And so in this patient, with a transient ischemic attack, we can directly look at the vessels. In this particular case, we, we managed to show a, a, um, a severe left carotid, left internal carotid artery stenosis that was the main cause of this TIA. And so this patient was not discharged anymore because we have a, a critical stenosis that needs urgent treatment. And so we can see here in the carotid ultrasound assessment that the patient has both a morphological and hemodynamic a critical stenosis of the internal carotid artery with a post-stenotic decrease of the blood flow. And, this, um, uh, and uh, it was also possible to look at the collateral, at the compensatory flow in the ophthalmic artery with an inversion of the ophthalmic artery of the left ophthalmic artery uh, uh, flow and also a decrease in the amplitude of the, of the flow wave in the middle cerebral artery on the left compared with the right. So uh, at this point, right in the emergency department, we have the whole picture about the vascular status of the patient. And it was possible to treat him within 48 hours by performing an angiography with angioplasty and stenting, revascularization of the uh, left uh, internal carotid artery and obtaining a complete revascularization with normalization of the intracranial blood flow. So this is just an example of how the, the uh, uh, easy assessment to the ultrasound techniques can give us the opportunity to study the, the patient and to decide in the best way right from the emergency department. So the emergent use of neurosonological screening allows us to look at the vascular status of the patient and even adapt or change our therapeutic strategy according to the findings. This is of utmost importance in patients with fluctuating neurological conditions, with low NIH, but large vessel diseases. And it gives us the opportunity to look at the activation of compensatory mechanisms and to stratify the risk of the patient and to decide in the best way on which therapeutic strategy are we going to choose. So this is a rapid screening method that we can use at the bedside. It's non-invasive. And it gave us the idea about the vascular situation of the patient with stroke and TIA right from the emergency department. It gave us the opportunity to identify multiple pathological situations in their hemodynamic consequences and to look at the collateral patterns and the vascular reserve of the patients, even re redefining therapeutic strategies with implications for the outcome of these patients. So when we talk about the transcranial Doppler, in this specific situation, it gave us the opportunity to have real-time hemodynamics information. So we can monitor in a non-invasive way what is happening in the cerebral blood flow, with the cerebral blood flow. And so we can analyze what is happening with the patient, for example, during the reperfusion uh, therapeutics, mainly chemical reperfusion with TPA, or even in endovascular recanalization using thrombectomy. It's possible, as I showed you in that cl clinical case report, 
to uh, perform the emergent assessment in the emergency department of patients with TIA and stroke and decide in the best way, in the best way uh, concerning the, th the best therapeutic option. And so it gave us the opportunity to perform rapid investigation of these patients with acute stroke. So I will give you some examples of the use in reperfusion candidates, starting with the diagnosis of uh, arterial occlusion. So everybody knows the TB score that has been published a couple of years ago, that has a high specificity um, and uh, uh, not that good, but even so uh, very good sensitivity about the uh, uh, flow grading, the flow grade uh, of the of the patient, and so the presence or absence of uh, vascular occlusion. So we have this TB score from zero to five. Five is normal, and zero uh, is about absent flow, so no flow signs uh, uh, in the TCD assessment. And this give gave, give us the the opportunity to know if the vessel is occluded and the point or. The, the, the place where the thrombus uh, is uh, at that precise moment. So this gave us the opportunity also to monitor the response to the therapeutic. So we can start with a patient with an occlusion, for example, of a middle cerebral artery. And while we are performing the therapeutic with the TPA, we can look what is happening in the vessel. And in this particular case, we see the flow starting to increase in the occluded vessel with an improve, a constant improve in the, uh, in the TB score of this patient. Now we have the systolic, uh, the systolic wave well defined and we have the, 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 color, the color coded uh, duplex so showing the, the, the reperfusion or the recanalization of the, the vessel. And here we have the same situation from a, an occlusion or almost occluded vessel with a TB, with a low TB score. And then after a couple of minutes after the administration of TPA, the recanalization of the vessel and the progressive improvement in the TB score and reaching at the end the TB5 with complete recanalization in a normal wave of flow. So the TCD also allows us to do it to, to do this monitoring in continuous, and we can also see at the same time some uh, uh, emboli or some transient signs concerning to, to emboli, mostly uh, showing the the, the recanalization of the vessel and the fragmentation of the thrombus. We can also look at the circulation in patients that have clinical fluctuation. So here we have a patient that, that has a persistent occluded vessel, but with clinical fluctuations. This traduces the, the, the uh, collateral uh, uh, pattern of circulation. So we, here we have the collaterals working, and despite the persistent occlusion, the area of, the, of ischemia is... Uh, uh, um, receiving blood through the uh, collateral uh, flow. And so the patient is improving, but the, this flow from the collaterals is not enough. And at certain time points, it uh, um, overcomes the ability of compensation from the arterial blood flow and the patient uh, gets worse again. So we have even cases of a clinical uh, uh, of uh, some mismatch clinical occlusion so patients where the occlusion persists but the area of infarct is is low and the the, the clinical symptoms improve in this particular case this means that the collateral flow is working correctly and is enough to overcome the occlusion or at least partially the occlusion of the the vessel and we can uh, uh, also, seeing some patients, the phenomenon of reocclusion. We know that some patients with the occlusion of large vessels, like middle cerebral arteries, and treated with TPA, can recanalize completely, but uh, a few uh, minutes uh, after they can reocclude again because. Uh, the thrombosis mechanisms are still active and it is possible to have a, a new reocclusion. And we can see all this happening uh, uh, with the, the TCD monitoring. 
So in, also in these patients, we can identify some patients that are not responding to the therapeutical approaches. So when we are treating patients with TPA, we can see where is the where the vessel is occluded, and we can uh, mainly in centers that do not have access direct access to uh, endovascular techniques, we can see which patients that are treated with TPA are not responding and should be uh, as soon as possible. Uh, uh, have access to uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Of course, that at this time point, with the evidence that we have for endovascular treatment, we are not waiting to see if the vessel uh, opens or not. We are directing the patient as soon as possible to the to the the hospitals that have the opportunity to treat the patients with endovascular approaches. But this gives us the opportunity to see what is happening at any time point with the occluded vessel of the patient that is treated with TPA. So as we see uh, in the beginning of, uh, of this presentation, we can uh, have, uh, uh, we have the opportunity to emergent access of patients with TIAs and stroke. And so this early vascular study can help us reducing the stroke risk by as much as 80%. This is another example of a patient with atherosclerotic stenosis of internal carotid artery that was treated uh, as soon as possible after the diagnosis of this critical stenosis. But we have uh, other areas of interest in patients with, uh, with acute stroke. One of the most interesting one is the assessment of the autoregulation and what happens with the regulation of the blood flow during the acute ischemic lesions. So we know that the brain and the brain arteries have the ability to maintain the same blood flow uh, despite some variations in the systemic arterial pressure. So this is done by regulating the diameter of the small artery, arterioles of the, the blood, but this is uh, only true bit in, a, in a given interval of systemic, of systolic blood pressure. So um, at the top maximum or at the bottom uh, uh, line of this, uh, of this uh, autoregulation curve, the uh, autoregulation systems are overcome and we can um, have consequences of the maximum constriction with an increase in the area of infarct, so extending the infarct area or contributing to edema and uh, hemorrhagic transformation. Um, and uh, on, the, on, the, on the bottom uh, uh, area, we have the increase of the area of ischemia. So if we have uh, an arterial blood pressure too high that overcomes the autoregulation, we have an increase in the area or of edema, and we have the risk of hemorrhagic transformation. We, if we have too low uh, values of arterial uh, uh, blood pressure, we have an extension of the uh, ischemic area. So, so what we try by assessing the cerebral autoregulation is to know it, between which intervals can we adapt the control of the arterial pressure. So in order to maintain this constant or to optimize the uh, uh, flow um, in the in the blood vessels of the of the brain. So we know that in primary and secondary ischemic brain injury, the, these adaptive responses are are altered, so are not working correctly. Uh, and understanding this phenomena can help us improving and optimizing uh, the hemodynamic parameters by uh, facilitating the response of the. Uh, cerebral blood circulation to diminish the risk of increasing the area of ischemia. So this is then the regulation of the systemic blood pressure and uh, uh, the cerebral blood flow is done by looking at this cerebral autoregulation. We have also baroreflexes, namely in the carotid arteries that are responsible for uh, influencing the values of uh, blood of systemic blood pressure. And we have mechanisms that contribute to this cerebral autoregulation, both neurogenic, myogenic, and also metabolic. So this is what we call the neurovascular coupling that uh, uh, allows us to understand how uh, cerebral autoregulation uh, works. And we can access 
uh, in such a way, in such a uh, most or more or less the direct way, by looking at the blood flow using ultrasonology, neurosonology techniques, and by uh, time to point to point determinations of arterial blood pressure. So this uh, approach, the, by looking at the autoregulation in acute stroke using the transcranial Doppler and continuous blood pressure measurement, we can. Uh, have a, a rise, high resolution way and uh, feasible way at the head of the patient to look at the uh, autoregulation. And the problem is that there are different techniques, so it's uh, necessary to, uh, um, uh, to, to standardize the methods that we use to assess this autoregulation in acute stroke. But we know that uh, if we can um, access to this autoregulation in a rigorous way, we can obtain uh, important data to blood pressure treatment and to, uh, to the optimization uh, of the uh, uh, hemodynamic parameters, improving uh, the um, possibility to save more uh, brain tissue. So, but the neurosonology techniques are also important in, in patients with stroke after the acute phase, mainly uh, in the etiological investigation. So, uh, it gave us the opportunity to, to look for different uh, pathologic condition, conditions. It also helped us during uh, post-acute uh, uh, post -acute procedures of treatment. And so, monitoring these procedures, like in cardiac surgery or in carotid revascularization, it gives us the opportunity to, to study a little bit more about the vasoreactivity and the compensatory mechanisms, for example, in patients with atherosclerotic disease of the carotid arteries, and also in more extreme conditions in patients, not only with, with the vascular diseases, but in other situations situations, it gives us the opportunity or contributes to a more, more robust diagnosis of brain death. Also, in, in, the case, in particular case of stroke in pediatrics, uh, the use of TCD uh, screening uh, helps to predict which are the children that are in most risk of having a stroke in conditions like drepanocytosis. So we know that atherosclerotic uh, disease is an important cause of stroke and uh, these techniques can uh, give us important information right from the beginning of the pathologic uh, uh, atherosclerotic cascade. So by assessing the intima media thickness, we have an independent measure of the, vasco of the vascular risk. We can look at the plaques and the different characteristics of these plaques. Where are they located? If they are regular or irregular, what is the composition of these plaques? And uh, estimate the risk of rupture. Well, concerning transcranial Doppler, in this particular situation, we can look at the intracranial hemodynamic consequences of the atherosclerotic disease, the pattern of collateralization, and also look at the functional reserve of these patients. It can also, uh, we can also use these techniques to look uh, uh, at those patients after revascularization procedures, after stenting or endarterectomy. We, have, uh, we do a, a regular follow-up of these patients trying to assess possible um, risk to noses after the, the intervention. But it is very useful in other conditions despite um, um, despite uh, uh, atherosclerotic disease. It can show us uh, to, uh, other pathological conditions like thrombi, like uh, arterial dissection. There, is, there are particularly important in uh, young patients. It's one of the most important causes of stroke in young patients. Uh, it can give us some important information about uh, hemodynamic changes in other conditions like sub subclavia steel syndrome, uh, uh, situations of uh, uh, inflammatory diseases of the vessel wall, like arteritis, where it shows this hollow, this in inflammatory, uh, hypoechogenic uh, uh, aspect of the of the of the vessel wall, showing areas of stenosis and and uh, dil dilation of the of the vessel. Um, one of the of one of the most typical examples is the uh, important information that we obtain in patients with suspected temporal arthritis. So this hypodense aloe and the presence of stenosis spots is very specific of this condition in uh, in uh, in uh, the temporal arteries and allows us in this condition to guide the biopsy and to um, 
uh, uh, obtain uh, uh, a sample uh, uh, with this biopsy that can show or confirm the, definitely the, the diagnosis. So in this particular case, we must pay attention to the involvement of other vessels because particularly in the posterior circulation is relatively common to have uh, inflammatory changes also. It can show us also other conditions like aneurysms. This is a, a, um, a huge aneurysm of the carotid, of internal carotid artery wall. So um, sometimes we see these images in some patients. When we look in, uh, at other particular situations, so the, the, the ultrasonographic te technologies allows us to study and to look for microembolic signals. This uh, uh, can be shown in patients with cardiac conditions, valvular pathology, uh, atherosclerotic plaques in the, in the aortic arch, but also in patients with atherosclerotic disease of the carotid arteries or in systemic diseases, inflammatory systemic diseases. So it can show like, uh, like uh, high intensity transient signs um, fragments of uh, uh, platelet aggregation, particles of atheroma, but the, the, the distinction of these uh, different types of high intensity transient signs is difficult in clinical practice. It's also important to test for the presence of right to left shunt, namely in patients with PFO. We have this three grade uh, uh, classification of the right to left shunt in patients with PFO according to the number of, of signs that we detect uh, uh, at rest and after the Valsalva maneuver giving uh, the idea of how important uh, is the communication between the right and the left uh, atria uh, or the right and the left circulation. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to monitor patients during car cardiac surgery, carotid surgery, or other in, uh, endovascular revascularization procedures. And we can uh, look at the vasoreactivity. Uh, so this is an indirect measure uh, about the um, vasomotor reserve, for example, in patients with atherosclerotic carotid stenosis. We have the uh, ability of the brain, of the blood circulation to autoregulate. So we talked uh, previously about the cerebral autoregulation. And we can use these vasoreactivity tests to see if we have um, reached the maximum ability of the uh, cerebral vessels to dilate and to resist to the pathological condition, or if we still have uh, a, a vascular reserve so if the, 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 the brain circulation can still dilate a little more to uh, overcome the risk of uh, ischemia. So this is an example of one of these patients with a severe atherosclerotic stenosis of the internal carotid artery and assessing the vasoreactivity in this particular case with a, 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 an important asymmetry between the left and the right uh, circulation by showing that the reserve after the stimulus is overcome and so the patient is at a high risk of developing ischemia in this territory. So as I told you before, another uh, uh, use, uh, possible use of the neurosonology techniques in these patients when the, the evolution of the patient, is, uh, the patient is bad and the patient uh, evolves to, to, to death, uh, uh, neurosonology techniques can also be helpful uh, at looking to the patterns of circulation that support the diagnosis of brain death. So here we have the, the, the scheme, the algorithm that, sh that shows that uh, um, as much as we increased in the intracranial pressure, we have a decreased uh, of the blood flow uh, with this, uh, initially with this to and fro um, a typical pattern showing that the the, the lesion is irreversible and so the circulation is not uh, um, working anymore in, a, in, the in the correct way and so uh, we end with these uh, systolic uh, uh, small uh, waves and uh, uh, with no flow at the end so when the intracranial pressure is so high that the circulation in the brain stops completely. So uh, about the use of neurosonology in stroke, some, uh, some 
ideas at, uh, at the end. So it's a rapid screening method at the bedside, non-invasive, that gives us the opportunity to look at the vascular situation of the patient, identify multiple pathological conditions and their hemodynamic consequences, the collateral patterns, the vascular reserve, and allows us or help us in defining or redefining the therapeutic strategies with significant implications for the outcome of these patients. We are trying to put all the efforts in better assessing the autoregulation mechanisms in these patients, um, but um, uh, um, we have uh, um, many other applications, that, as I showed you, uh, mainly in the, investiga in the etiologic investigation uh, of the, the vascular disease of the brain. Uh, we have the ability to monitor some procedures and at the end even contributing to the diagnosis of brain death in patients with more serious conditions. And so this is the, the, the end of the first part of my, of my lecture. Uh, in the next couple of minutes, um, I will share some ideas about the uh, use of CT calling in the management of acute stroke. So a completely different uh, um, issue or not that much because we are here discussing about uh, stroke and acute stroke. So we know the effort that has been done uh, mainly by the European Stroke Organization and the World Stroke Organization in contributing to the uh, development and better assessment of all stroke patients to uh, the new revascularization techniques from uh, uh, chemical approaches with TPA and other agents that are being studied and also more recently with the approval of endovascular uh, techniques. So we know that stroke and cerebrovascular disease burden is uh, uh, really high worldwide. It's one of the most important causes of death and disability. In Portugal, it's still the number one, so it's the most important cause of death and disability in my country. And we have more than 1.3 million people with stroke worldwide. So every hour, three persons have a stroke, namely in Portugal, and one of, of these ones, one does not survive and at least half are left with disabled sequelae. So we have to put all the efforts in treating uh, better our patients. So stroke is a medical emergency. As we know, the concept has changed in the, in the last two or three decades. We, we, are now have, we now have this opportunity to treat patients and we have to take them as soon as possible to the hospitals that can better treat them. So we, we are used to say that time is brain and time is really brain. So we have to put these patients as soon as possible in the hospitals that have the ability to treat them and offer them the best drugs and the best techniques to, as soon as possible, revascularize the, the blood vessel that is occluded and giving the, uh, uh, the, the highest chance of recovering the blood flow and avoiding the ischemic damage of the brain. So uh, for many years, we are trying to do what we call the quantum leap uh, looking for neuroprotection. So the finding of a uh, an, an, uh, an, uh, good uh, neuroprotectant agent is really, would be very uh, important because it would allow us to help in the repairing of the flow, to make more, the tissue more resilient to low blood flow, and even increase the therapeutic window. We know that there are huge asymmetry between uh, countries, and even in the same countries, we have areas where the patients get to the hospital quick, and uh, other areas where they take two to three or four hours to get to the closest hospital and to have access to this treatment. So uh, all the benefit that we see here in this table with the revascularization techniques, chemical or mechanical ones, are for patients or are improved uh, for patients who get to the hospital soon. So we know that the, the brain metabolism the brain metabolism depends on the cerebral circulation, on the cerebral blood flow. The glucose is the most exclusive substrate for energy metabolism of the brain. The high O2 consumption, um, because the, the, the metabolism of the glucose in the brain is uh, uh, almost... Um, uh, it's, it's done by using oxygen, by using the oxidative me metabolism. And so the brain energy reserves are negligible and the brain needs 
uh, for this metabolism to have a constant blood supply. So we have discussed previously these mechanisms of cerebral autoregulation that allows the brain to maintain a constant cerebral blood flow regardless of the variations in blood pressure or intracranial pressure, avoiding both the consequences of overcoming high or low the, the values of, uh, of uh, optimal cerebral autoregulation. And we know that as low as, the, as, low, um, as we go uh, when looking at the thresholds of ischemia, the more important and irreversible can be the damage. So at the beginning, we have a disturbed function with preserved structure of the brain when we start decreasing the cerebral blood flow. But at a certain point, we have an irreversible structural damage. And at this point on, the brain is no longer, or the brain tissue is no longer possible to be saved. So what we want to do is to save what we call the penumbra, this area that is functional uh, uh, malfunctioning, but is still uh, uh, viable in terms of uh, uh, structural integrity. So we have the area of the core that is already completely damaged, is uh, irreversibly damaged, but we have all this area of penumbra that is possible to be saved as soon as we can reestablish the blood flow. So we want to avoid the increase of the area of core, and so we have to try to put all the efforts in the revascularization, but we would love to have uh, therapeutical options to uh, overcome or to, to manage these mechanisms that uh, are taking the, the, that are increasing the damage to the, to the brain, uh, mainly the excitotoxicity mechanisms, the oxidative stress, and even the post-ischemic inflammation. So in the last few years, these concepts uh, have changed. Now we know that this involves uh, not only the neurons, but uh, also the endothelial cells, the blood vessels themselves, the pericytes, the astrocytes, and all this complex pathology um, is uh, uh, more and more well understood. So we know that this pathophysiology of the ischemic brain lesion is complex. It involves the decreasing of the uh, energy producing activities in the brain with consequent uh, failure of ionic pumps, the, the generation of uh, mediators that are toxic for the brain, and also uh, mechanisms of apoptosis and the blockage of the cell repair mechanism. So we, what we want is to have some drugs that can uh, interfere with these mechanisms and stop a few of them, avoiding further damage of the brain cells. So citicoline is an essential intermediate in the biosynthesis pathway of structural phospholipids that are important or essential constituents of all the biological membranes, including the neuronal membrane. And we know that citicoline acts at different levels of this ischemic cascade. So it can help uh, on normalizing some of the altered uh, biochemical mechanisms and has like a pleiotropic effect in these mechanisms involved in ischemic brain injury. And so has like a neuroprotection effect and uh, helps in the restoration of the levels of some neurotransmitters. So this pleiotropic effect that we can see in this, in this picture involves different, uh, different points of this cascade and different agents of this cascade. So it uh, uh, decreases the ischemic uh, lesion volume and accelerates the reabsorption of the cerebral edema by interfering in all these mechanisms. So it stimulates the brain, the brain plasticity, modulates the neurotransmitters, interferes with the angiogenesis, uh, with the stimulation of stem cells, and so there are uh, um, very uh, there are many targets for the action of this molecule of citicoline. Citicoline has been studied in acute ischemic stroke for, uh, a, long, for a long period of time. The first data, more robust data, came from individual patient data pooling analysis of some clinical trials. And in, in, uh, after this, with encouraging results of this analysis, um, clinical trial, the ICTOS trial, was, was uh, developed and, uh, um, uh, and uh, showed that uh, um, the, the, the use of citicoline 
uh, had uh, was positive for patients with ischemic stroke, or, although the trial was not uh, was neutral, so it was not confirmed to be efficacious in the treatment of moderate to severe acute ischemic stroke uh, with the methodology that was used. But if we look deeper into this study, we we can see that the patients included in the ICTUS trial were very severe patients with increased uh, uh, with uh, with high NIH stroke scale scores and with large infarct. So they were mainly patients with probably very small penumbra. And what we want to say is penumbra, where where we, we have seen that uh, that the the mechanisms there are uh, 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 there are changed by the the, the effect of CT choline can work is by uh, saving the penumbra by um, Avoiding the progression of ischemia in the penumbra area. On the other, on the other side, the old the, the 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 population included in the study were mainly constituted by old patients, so patients that have uh, uh, less neuroplasticity. So another important aspect that probably uh, uh, justifies why the the the, the study was not uh, so as positive as it was expected is the pro is the question of the ceiling effect. This means that almost all the patients included were treated in certified stroke units and treated early with more than 46% of patients treated with TPA. We were in the first uh, decade of the use of TPA. And uh, on the top of the best treatment, CT choline was not uh, able to show uh, uh, statistically significant clinical improvement. But if we uh, look um, at the comparison between patients that were treated with TPA and CT colon and patients that were not treated with TPA, the effect of CT colon remains significant. This means that this beneficial effect of CT colon uh, over time was diluted uh, in the parallel with the improvement of the standard care of acute screen ischemic stroke and mainly with the use of TPA. So when we look at the results of this trial and we put it in perspective with other trials published by uh, uh, joining almost 4,500 patients with, uh, with ischemic stroke, uh, uh, a systematic review was published by comparing uh, these patients that were treated with, with TPA and patients not treated with, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, patients treated, uh, not treated with TPA and patients not treated with TPA and treated with CT colon. And we see a tendency, a statistically significant tendency for a better outcome in patients treated with the optimized dosage of CT colon, two grams per day in the first 24 hours uh, and so this shows that uh, uh, CT colon has indeed an effect in patients with acute ischemic stroke, mainly in those patients that are treated with the recommended dosage and as soon as possible. So if we are looking at CT colon as a, a neuroprotectant, it, uh, the effect of the drug starts as soon as we put it in the circulation of the patient. And so if we look at the, the important concept that that time is brain, and mainly in countries where patients don't have immediate access to thrombolysis or other revascularization techniques, is of utmost importance to start the drug as soon as possible because uh, it, it is not only uh, it has not only this efficacy effect that we have shown, but also it's safe. So this is also confirmed by a parametric meta-analysis published in 2018 that shows that consistent with previous uh, uh, analysis, um, this suggests a smaller but still significant, uh, significant, statistically significant treatment effect of CT colon in, the, in these patients, mainly when we look to the post-stroke independence. So the, the CT colon seems to have really an effect, an important effect on the recovery from stroke. So not, not only uh, right in the, in the beginning, but uh, at the, uh, yeah, at the, at the um, follow-up of these patients, we obtain good results by treating the patients with CT colon. So don't forget that time is brain, so we should start treating the patients as soon as possible. Uh, this means by treating them immediately after suspecting of stroke. So CT colon is recommended to be started as soon as possible. We have no safety issues about their use 
in the acute or hyperacute phase of stroke. Don't forget to, to, to use uh, the drugs always in the recommended dosage because the, we, we, we potentiate the effect of the drug by using it with the recommended dosage. And don't forget also the data showing that there is a mild but significant long-term benefit because it's also uh, important to, to, to think about what we call mild effects in stroke patients. If, if we think about the functional uh, disability that those patients have and even the, the, the bad prognosis of many of the patients with the stroke that are not treated with revascularization techniques, even if the effect is mild with some of these approaches, the result for the patient is uh, quite important. And uh, even more if we look at the, the population of uh, stroke patients. So citicoline is also cost effective. There are some studies published uh, uh, in peer review uh, uh, journals showing that it is cost effective versus the conventional treatment in acute ischemic uh, stroke. And as a conclusion, I should say that uh, there is an evidence of this positive effect of citicoline on stroke patients. So when we look to the cumulative meta-analysis, uh, we can confirm this efficacy in the treatment of ac acute ischemic stroke with an imp uh, a significant odd ratio of 1.56. Um, the, 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 the concept that is always present when we think about patients with uh, uh, acute stroke is that time is brain. So whenever we are talking about uh, any kind of treatment, uh, uh, if the treatment is safe and if it, if it is efficacious in the hyperacute phase, we should start it as soon as stroke is suspected. And in the particular case of uh, CT colon, don't forget to uh, optimize the dosage uh, of, the, of the drug because the maximum benefit is only obtained if we have the correct dose of the, of the drug. And also that long-term effect can be uh, maximized in, even in stroke recovery. Uh, and uh, when we talk about CT colon, don't forget also that uh, other of the indications for the use of CT colon in patients with vascular cerebral disease, even, it's not only in the acute phase, but also in long-term uh, management of these patients, uh, especially when we are talking about the uh, cognitive consequences of the, uh, of the vascular disease, so what we call the vascular cognitive impairment. And so these are the, the, the possibilities, so the, forms, the formulations of CT choline that can be used in clinical practice. Uh, and I, so I, I, would fin I will finish with, the, with this slide and I, uh, I'm uh, of course available for, discuss for the discussion and for uh, any question that we could, that, that the audience wants to, to, to formulate. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alexander, for uh, highlighting the importance of uh, neurosynology, it's, 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 which is becoming more and more important actually in the field of stroke, and uh, it's, it's uh, becoming even routine practice in every stroke unit. And also in highlighting the importance of neuroprotection and citicoline. I will. I, I know we are late, so I will just give uh, choose some. Uh, I have a long list of questions, but I will choose very few questions because I know we are late. And uh, sorry for keeping you late like this. Uh, two questions for uh, Dr. Peter. Um, honey, don't worry. You, you can make it three or four questions. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, regarding the use of uh, tenecteplase, I know this is off-label, but some people will start now using tenecteplase in bridging. Would you recommend this uh, if it is available? Um, I uh, have had a discussion uh, about that with Georges Sivgulis, uh, who likes that approach. Um, I don't like it because... I do not know yet whether the patient that I treat with TNK will actually be bridged. So um, if you are in a hospital um, that is bridging patients and sending them to an endovascular center, you are using a non-approved, non 
tested uh, as a lone standing IV treatment therapy. And uh, on the other hand, you are withholding uh, the standard of care. And in my scientific life, this is inappropriate. In my jurisdictional system, this is medical legally questionable. Um, and uh, if you have a patient that uh, gets an ICH, he might very well sue you and say, you gave me TNK, which is not approved in expectance of a bridging that uh, I didn't get in a 50% chance of futile transfers. Uh, and I got a bleeding, but you would have the standard of care. And in my language, fuck you, I'm going to sue you. And in Germany, they will be successful. I would not do it until this is ultimately clarified. I would not violate a standard of care. I guess this will answer also the second question, which somebody is asking about in the COVID era, since this will minimize the exposure and it's just one shot. Also, TNK, if you are, you suggest we can use it. I know also of label in in in, in this era. <laughs> yeah. Not everything changes because of COVID. Uh, one question regarding the clear ER uh, study, which. Uh, uh, Eptifibatide uh, plus uh, RTPA, uh, would you recommend the use of uh, 3B2A uh, 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 plus RTPA? And, uh, the trials are too small. Uh, I, know, uh, I know that trial, it's a couple of years old, by the way, and it was uh, never a phase three trial. It was a small hypothesis generating trial which showed promising results. And then the company never followed up so um, <clears throat> for those patients that I used 10 years ago, I used GP2B3 uh, a antagonists. Those are the patients that nowadays I treat with uh, double antiplatelets. Um, and uh, I now start to tend to treat them with ticagrelor and aspirin. I'm still in a thinking process here after the TALIS trial, uh, but there's less heterogeneity than in the clopidogrel plus aspirin trial. So in, in truth, I think that um, GP2B3A uh, antagonists are obsolete. Uh, this is my question. Regarding after they extend IA trial nine hours, but they are using the rabbit software. So, can we use other methods like the uh, what was in the wake up stroke, for example, the mismatch of diffusion flare or clinical mismatch uh, to judge whether to give TPA or not? This is a wonderful question. Uh, I just last week had to prepare, and it was an awful lot of work. I had to prepare talk about. AI, AI is standing for Advanced Imaging with Artificial Intelligence. And um, to be honest, um, uh, Rapid gives you a simplified magenta green map for 50,000 euros a year that you are willing to trust because it makes your life so easy and simple. But in fact, it is an arbitrary choice of thresholds based on several mathematical models in sequence that all try to cope for the imperfection of the contrast time curve assessment of cerebral perfusion, meaning throw it in the toilet. <laughs> um, and I have to correct that because as a pathophysiologically speaking, you do not image the penumbra with a contrast bolus time tracking method. You cannot. You can try to mathematically cope for it, but you know, the, the, the physiological time parameter for those maps should be mean transit time. But they are using TTP approximated from PET uh, studies, which then changed to Tmax. For CT, they use a 30% relative CBF uh, and decline for infarct core assessment. These are all arbitrarily chosen limits. So at the end, I do not trust 
rapid, but rapid is the surrogate system, as imperfect as it may be, that was used in the trials to select patients. So at the end, there is some rational to use it. I personally like the diffusion uh, flare mismatch, but what I like even better nowadays is a non-contrast CT that's just normal. So going back to the good old times, if you have a CT, CTA, where the CT has an aspect of 9 or 10, and the patient has an NIH score of, let's say, 5, 7, 9, 10, 11, I don't give a, anything about the time window. I just treat off label. Um, and um, the guidelines, on the other hand, tell you you should follow advanced imaging criteria precisely if you want to treat outside of the label. That is where I choose the DAWN criteria, which are more straightforward. Diffusion-based assessment of the infar core is okay. You can do a simple volumetry on that, and this is okay. Perfusion CT is not very good for infarct core. So in those patients with an extended time window, at the end, I use a MRI protocol with, without perfusion imaging <clears throat> to use DWI flare mismatch and for extended IV decisions and to use DWI core clinical mismatch for DAWN criteria assessment. That is a very brief answer. The original talk is about 60 minutes. And if you're willing to listen to perfusion, yeah. definitely. <laughs> the physiology, the next time, I'm happy to be your guest again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, now, uh, for, can for I just comment? I really, sorry. Yes, definitely, can Dr. Ask, Alexander. Yeah, because um, uh, uh, um, uh, I like very much uh, um, uh, listening uh, about the use of uh, non contrast or uh, of uh, CT scan, of simple CT scan in the approach of patients with acute ischemic stroke. But because even in many countries of Europe, like Portugal, many of the hospitals don't have the possibility to have uh, uh, multimodal imaging. So we only have in uh, acute stroke patients the possibility to have a CT scan and an angio CT. So this uh, approach of using uh, the criteria uh, that uh, Dr. Schellinger uh, um, explained about the use of, uh, uh, of having a, a normal CT scan or a high aspect uh, non-contrast CT scan with an occluded vessel in the NGO CT will allow uh, many, many of these hospitals and many of the patients treated in these hospitals to have access to uh, um, endovascular treatment outside the, the, the most strict recommendations because because most of these hospitals don't have the possibility of even uh, performing uh, an MRI imaging in the, in this uh, acute phase uh, stroke patients. Yes. Now, now a couple of questions for Dr. Alexander. Uh, can we depend on an, uh, on persistent low TP grade after TPA uh, that further reperfusion using mechanical thrombectomy is needed? And do we proceed for a as uh, in, in the trial, you, in the study, uh, SACRIS study. I'm, I'm really sorry, but there, there was a, an interference. I couldn't listen to the last can we depend? That. Can we depend on persistence of low tip, uh, tipi, mm -hmm. low tipi grade? Low tipi, yeah. Low tipi grade after TPA, that further reperfusion using mechanical thrombectomy is needed, and we proceed for it as in, in the study you showed, the SACRIS study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think so, because we have this possibility uh, for uh, the direct access of the vascular status of the patient. And if we are uh, perfusing uh, TPA and we have a, persi a persistent uh, uh, low TB uh, showing that the vessel is still occluded, we should transfer the patient as soon as possible to a center that has the possibility to to, to, to make uh, endovascular treatments. Because, of course, th there will be some patients that when arriving to those hospitals have recanalized, but it's better to have a patient that is already recanalized being transferred to another hospital than keeping a patient that, that is with a persistent occlusion that we are not going to treat anymore. Uh, one last question. Uh, do you recommend the TCD pulsatility index to predict the outcome of thrombolytic therapy uh, whether before or after receiving TPA? 
Yeah, we, we don't have uh, med, uh, much experience about using uh, the, the positivity index as a prognostic factor in, in, those, in those patients. But sometimes the positivity index can give us important data also about the presence of some complications. So we have identified in some patients that are in, uh, in uh, um, uh, uh, monitoring with, with TCD and where is a, an, an increased positivity index uh, that have been shown to, to have complications like, like bleeding, like intracranial bleeding. Uh, and so this is, uh, these are important data, but not as a prognostic factor. We have the, no experience on using that, but it can be a promise, uh, promise uh, approach according to the study. Yeah. I know there is some other questions, but I know we are late. So I would thank very, very much our two eminent speakers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter, uh, Professor Peter, and uh, thank you, Professor uh, Dr. Alexander, for your contribution and being with us today. And uh, Dr. Peter, we are waiting for your uh, lecture about this uh, mismatch again. <laughs> Anytime you call, I'll be there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, good evening. Have a good night. Goodbye. Uh, thank you. Bye.